Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to virtually welcome you to the Yale University Art Gallery and to acknowledge the indigenous peoples and nations, including the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pogosset, Niantic, Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples who have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what we now call the state of Connecticut. Though you may not be with us here in Connecticut today, I invite you all to take a moment to reflect on and honor those whose ancestral lands you may find yourself on and offer gratitude to the land that nourishes us. My name is Cindy Schwartz. I'm a painting conservator here at the gallery. Today's program is the keynote lecture for the third biennial Students and Mentors Institute in Technical Art History. This week long intensive engages students from historically black colleges and universities with the fields of art conservation and technical art history. It's a collaboration between Yale and the HBCU Alliance of Museums and Art Galleries and is generously funded by the Samuel H. Kress Foundation. 12 students and five faculty members have spent very full days on Zoom, immersing themselves in lectures, discussions, and even hands-on workshops despite technical glitches, Zoom fatigue, and last minute schedule changes. They met the challenge with insight, enthusiasm, and it's been a memorable week for all of us. I'd like to thank a few people, starting with Max Marmer and the Crest Foundation for their financial support, UNCF Mellon for additional support for four of our students, Dr. Carol McFarlane and Dr. Jantiel Robinson of the HBCU Alliance, Sean Walker, and all of our colleagues and support staff that have helped make this week possible. I've learned so much from our students this week who are insightful, curious, and really just so smart. But what impressed me the most is the attention they pay to uplifting and caring for one another. As a conservator, the concept of collections care is constantly redefining itself for me. And increasingly, the care part of it is what preoccupies me. Of course, I think about the best practices for caring for our collection but also how do we care for one another in the field? How do we bring care to ourselves? And as conservators, the concept of care transcends time. We pay equal attention to the material and immaterial evidence of the past, the needs of future generations and our present state. And we're constantly trying to make sense of this. I've come to realize that providing care for paintings is a gift um, to myself that, that nourishes me. Why am I talking about this? <laughs> I think something I can offer to an incoming generation of conservators is that gift for themselves. For this year's event, I selfishly wanted to invite an artist and a curator who would help me explore this concept of care and materiality across time. Some time ago, Anne Collins Smith introduced me to Vanessa German's piece Delia on the Plain and it has come back into my mind along with Anne's consideration of it over and over in the past months. And as I learned more about Vanessa's work, I realized that they would be perfect for today's talk. Anne Collins Smith is the interim director and curator of collections at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. Among the exhibits Smith has organized are multiple choices, perspectives on the Spelman collection, um, showcase and tell, and present presence meditations on the Spelman College collection in 2019. Um, Marin Hassinger, Dreaming, and Howard Dina Kundal. Anne is a current fellow with the Center for Cur uh, Curatorial Leadership. I've spent the last week with Anne as one of the SMIDA mentors. Her generosity as a colleague and a mentor and her willingness to be vulnerable in the pursuit of shared deep understanding amazes and inspires me, and I thank her for that. Vanessa German is a self-taught citizen artist based in Homeward, Pittsburgh. Her list of exhibitions and accolades are too numerous to recount, but I'll recount a few anyway. 
She is the recipient of the 2015 Louis, Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation grant, the 2017 Jacob Lawrence Award for the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the 2018 Don Tyson Prize. Her exhibition Reckoning, Grief and Light is currently on view at the Frick Pittsburgh. Closer to New Haven, if you're here in Connecticut, you can see her work, A List of Things Never to Things to Never Be Forgotten in the Mattituck Museum's A Face Like Mine exhibition uh, in Waterbury. She works across sculpture, performance, communal rituals, immersive installation, and photography. She has described her works uh, as acts of love and practice in her studio. Her work is inextricably intertwined with her role as an activist and as a community leader. I'm so excited to now hear from Vanessa about her work and after she um, shares, Anne and Vanessa and I will come back together for a conversation about materiality, care, and the preservation and presentation of the tangible and intangible. Please welcome Anne and Vanessa. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here with you all. I'm Vanessa. I'm coming to you from the West Coast. I'm in Los Angeles on um, Tongva land and other um, indigenous lands that were violently taken from people who still exist, who still live here. And so honoring um, the nature that I am and honoring the nature of the earth and the ocean and water, I stand with gratitude um, and love and grace on this land and um, I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, and to be here with Cindy and Anne is a gift also. After um, I share some of my work with you, we'll be in conversation with Anne and Cindy will come back on and we'll be able to um, take more questions but as I enter into this time of sharing my work, you can feel free to ask questions at any time uh, through the chat or the Q&A. Um, I'm really interested in what people are curious about and what comes up for you as I share images and share language uh, about the wholeness of my practice. So perhaps you will take us to a place that I might not have ever engineered we could go through your curiosity. So um, ask questions at any time. I'm gonna share some images and then I will um, come back on the screen. So I would like to begin, I'm gonna begin with a, with a short uh, making of a performance for this moment. So as Cindy mentioned, I, and um, I work across disciplines. I work in the wholeness of uh, the creative field that is available to me through my human technology and my imagination and um, the experiences that my mother and my mother's mothers have given me. So I am really interested in consciousness and in the spirit and the presence of the spirit in the living world. So I am going to make a poem, which is basically a freestyle and um, I'm going to make it as an entrance into the time that we will share together today, honoring the spirit of creativity, honoring the strength and the presence of our ancestors and of the planet Earth inside of our bodies as we are nature on nature, and also as an encouragement to any artist or creative individuals who are listening to this right now, who might feel or be experiencing stuckness, um, congestion between your heart, mind, creative, imaginative places. So that's what this piece is for. 
here for the soul and for the truth and for the light and for the bright truth that rises up through your fingertips in your hands and the palms of your hands and the eyes that center themselves in the center of your hands and the machine of your heart in the lucid dream of the dance of your feet moving through streets where there is no pain and no shame and no police to come and claim you and game up your freedom here for the love of freedom for the wings of freedom pushing out through the bones through the soul through the rib cage and into the expansive edgeless horizon of the Pacific Ocean meeting, every ocean meeting, every body of water that has ever existed, that exists even in the evidence of the water that resides in our bodies right now. We are specific and we are precise and we are deliberate and we are on purpose in our humanity. We are divine in our humanity, in our wholeness, in our wildness, in our weirdness, in our exhaustion, even we are holy and we are divine and we deserve to stand in our time and in our flesh and in our bodies inside of this wholeness and to gleam against one another like the brightest refracting hologram like lights ever existed and ever beamed from the cosmos in this very moment that I stand in a kitchen in Venice, California to wherever you are in Connecticut or around the world and in Mississippi and Alabama and Alaska to all the places where we exist as human beings. May we be uplifted and seen and held in our wholeness. May we have full and complete access to our imaginations, to the power of our souls, through our hands, through our flesh, through our teeth and through our bones. May you know deep friendship and grace and creativity on this day. And let us step into this movement. Let us us move into this day with courage and with love and with presence of heart. All right, so I'm going to share some images. And again, you can ask questions at any time because questions and curiosity are most potent and most powerful. I am excited to share images with you and they're not coming necessarily in any kind of order, but they are going to give you an experience of the different ingredients in my practice. And I can unfurl those for you in their dimensionality and how they resound inside of um, my dimensional self. So my political, spiritual, um, communal, social, queer, uh, black, femme self. So I begin with this image of the front porch of the art house, which is um, a perfect entrance for me to talk about why I call myself a citizen artist. I'm a self-taught artist um, and the living understanding that I have of that is that um, the essence of my being in the accumulated creative information of my DNA that is inside of the marrow of my bones, I come from a line of creative healing, um, nature-centered human beings um, through the line of my people. And my mother was an artist and her mother was an artist and um, they weren't necessarily artists who came up, in, who were, had an academic art education. My mother had some. So for me to be a citizen artist is really uh, and to be a self-taught artist is to recognize that there is a way that your wholeness um, is, there's a way that my wholeness is evidenced in the entire fabric of my life. I am not an artist only when I'm in the studio. I am not creative only when I have certain materials in front of me. Um, being a self-taught artist for me is a way of coming into the self and coming in to the dimensional presence and the weight of wholeness through creativity that has um, really spread out into tendrils of creative life that um, has taken the shape of a career that um, other people come to other ways. I came to this 
at, by dint of um, being baptized deeply in my soul. So being a self-taught artist means that my mother taught me, her mother taught me. I have learned from the invisible places of my soul. I learn and I gather by trusting my instincts and trusting my heart and moving towards materials and moving towards alignment with a sense of deep rightness inside of myself, which is radical on the land that we're living in for a black queer femme to have a life that is centered around being at rightness and at wholeness with my humanity, right? Because on this land, Black folks were never supposed to be whole. We were never supposed to have freedom and we were never imagined to have these resources, freedom and wholeness. So to center my entire wellness and my entire life in radical wholeness is, um, is is a living revolutionary act. So we're looking at the front porch of the art house and it says the art house poem, being at the art house where you realize you had wings the whole time. Um, part of that poem um, came to me in a dream. I realized that in my life that people were always trying to tell me what I could and could not do. Some of you have had this experience, I'm sure, where people are like, you can't you can't be an artist. You can't speak at MIT. You don't have degrees. You can't do this. And I realized that people had spent a lot of energy trying to tell me who I could be and who I couldn't be while I was actually being those things. So I was like, oh, look, you're telling me I don't have wings, but I'm already flying. So it was that kind of sense. And um, the front porch of the art house is glass mosaic. Um, that was done by like everybody in my neighborhood. People would stop at the bus stop and they would work on this a little bit. And I think about being a citizen artist as being a fully dimensional um, on purpose citizen of my own humanity and of the ingredients of my humanity that are deeply important to me. So my blackness, my queerness, my womanness, my um, magical, my magic, my magical capacities of um, intellectual prowess and prowess of the heart. So as a citizen artist, I want to fully inhabit all of my human identities, which is with as much creativity and spirit of love and transformation and wholeness as I can possibly muster up the courage to live inside of. And so for me, um, the easiest way to live inside of the courage of being a whole creative human citizen is to share and to share love, to share what I love, and to share it with as few obstacles as possible. So this, this front stoop that you're looking at, this place where people come and they sit, they hang out with their friends, they wait for the bus, they kids ask questions, they learn to read by uh, looking at the letters on the art house. This is a way that I am always in a state of sharing because the house exists, it is beautiful. Beauty is an act of disruption, especially in neighborhoods like mine in Pittsburgh that um, suffer the ricochet and the scars of systemic racism, anti-Blackness, and living in a country that absolutely condones veins of hate towards uh, systemic hate, towards uh, people, places, and towards um, their opportunities and futures. So it's really important to have a place that is bountiful with beauty. And this is um, the art house. Um, it suffered a fire uh, in, on Valentine's Day of this year, which was really heartbreaking for me as somebody who believes in love. There's so much love in the house and on the house for to have had this fire on Valentine's Day. It really um, has uh, resonated inside of me to really think about and to go deeper into um, my a living understanding of how love operates in confusion, how love can operate in pain and in deep pain and in deep grief and in deep turmoil and in fear. Like what, how can I keep calling upon the living emergent um, love to show up? And that is also a part of my work as a citizen artist to, um, to ensconce and be as fully whole inside of love as I can muster. So uh, citizen artist and being a self-taught artist.
um, immersive installation is an important part of my practice. If you start at the art house and you see that it is immersed in this neighborhood, it is immersed in the sights, the sounds, the jazz, the rhythms, the traffic, the tire treads, the lives, the songs of an entire neighborhood. It is immersed into the lives of people who have put their hands into creation of the space, who have created and loved and done theater in the backyard there. So the art house is immersed, is ensconced in a neighborhood, is rooted in that place. And so when I am making installations, I'm really thinking about, um, human beings who don't necessarily come into art spaces with this vast encyclopedic knowledge of art history, but they're coming in maybe once or twice a year, and they're coming in to look, to breathe, to feel, to have a vivid and electric, and if possible, a meaningful human experience. And so this work that's in front of you right now is called Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies. I made it the year that 45 went into office when I started to keep track of how many um, BIPOC, how many trans women of color were being murdered around the country and what was happening in the aftermath and around those. But also as somebody like death is a really important part of my practice because love is a very is crucial is the central engine to my practice so um, as a child in Los Angeles I noticed that when people got killed on the street or if a certain kind of person got killed the way that the world talked about that person um, really shortened their existence to the moment of their death or to actions that led to their death and removed wholeness from them. So as a child, I started to do my own ceremonies, memorials, and rituals to surround the wholeness and to uplift the wholeness of the human lives that were lost around me. And for me, when I was a kid, that was people who were dying of AIDS. Um, that was a huge part of my childhood and people who were killed in gang violence. So I would do my own rituals and ceremonies. So sometimes we cannot be with our bodies is a ritual. It begins, it's got three stages to it. It begins outside of the museum with text from Toni Morrison and Yah Jesse and myself. And then you ritual into an antechamber and then you ritual through um, a huge fall of red theater curtains into this kaleidoscopic space that has a radio show in it. People are invited to dance in the space. Um, and the radio show is called the Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies radio show. And it speaks specifically to what happens when um, in different times of trauma with your body where sometimes you have to like leave your own body through your consciousness just to survive a moment or it speaks to this experience that I've had a couple times where I've been with people um, right after they've been shot on the street so when the police come and they put the police tape up I'm on the inside of the police tape and whoever comes after the police tape comes up you can't cross and you can't be near those bodies even if they're your children you can't touch them and you cannot be with those bodies and so um, I recognize that we live in a culture that treats death um, really strangely and with a lot of fear and, um, and doesn't have living rituals um, that are as uh, treated as connective tissue between the wholeness of life and the wholeness of what it is to have completeness in life into death. And so this artwork celebrates the creative spirit of of black trans women and it celebrates the creative spirit and the spirit of imagination of single mothers and of children. And um, it is an invitation to grieve and to dance in community in this museum space. And so one of the things I'm thinking about is how can museums become a part of how we ritual into our wholeness as human beings. Um, and this is a uh, work that I've done with lots of artists around the country called The Blue Walk. Um, it is a reckoning of grief and ritual and mourning to bring up the trauma uh, from the bones and the blood that have fallen on this land. Uh, this image specifically is from, these are from Omaha, Nebraska, when we did the ritual um, around the 100th memorial of the Willie Brown lynching, which was called the largest race riot in American history. And the ritual follows the path, um, it follows a specific path 
in any city that we do it in. The next city that we'll do it in is in Seattle in September. And so I'm thinking about how art, how creative moments can really bring wholeness and can elevate and affirm and align us to our wholeness with one another as human beings, to our human technology and to the earth. So how can art spaces be a part of that? And um, in your rituals, what, I'm gonna answer this question in your rituals, what for if visuals do you see, what are some messages that you receive from the divine? Um, so one of the things that I receive in messages from the divine all the time, whether I'm in my studio or in uh, an active ritual in a performance space, one of the things that always comes to me um, and comes through me is um, how powerful it is to be creative and to always be creative. So, um, to always count on creativity as a transformative technology in your humanity, to not underestimate your power and to be in love with one another, to love one another when you feel like you cannot love one another, to love one another when you feel like it's unbearable and to love yourself, to love yourself deeply and truly and to say yes to yourself and to find the frequency of yes that you are moving on and to find that frequency with one another all of these things are very intense and I'm speaking of them very quickly. So um, this grief song, this re reckoning the blue walk um, brings grief into our spaces with great um, permission to be held in the arms of grace and love. Some paintings I started in COVID time called the Black Botanicals on vintage botanical prints. And I'm bringing the black face into it. I'm in love with black faces, I'm in love with the black body and the black form. It is um, such a canvas of soul for me in my work. And uh, so here's some images of these paintings the, called the Black Botanicals series. And I'm going to just share quickly some other images that speak to human technology, that speak to um, working with power as an artist on purpose, working with power, working with spirit and working in that way um, without shame or without guilt or without a sense of inferiority in the face of the academic art world and the art world that can be really diminishing to self-taught artists to bringing I can't tell you how many times people have told me not to talk about love and not to talk about soul and not to talk about spirit in my practice because I would not be taken seriously. And I think that it is, um, it has been a, a struggle that I've had inside of myself to actually really reveal how dimensionally soulful my practice is. Um, this is an image of me in the garden um, of the art house. And, um, I'm not even gonna tell you what this photo is a reference to. I'm interested if anybody can tell what this photo references. Um, and this is a work when I, sometimes people ask me, they're like, how do you express your queerness in your work? And I make these figures, a lot of times they are holding hands and they're um, in uh, sort of gestures, sculptures and gestures of love and connection. And this is called, how can I love you with capitalism? And sometimes I think about, um, I think about myself as a hybrid creature, not American, not African, not totally even human. I definitely experience myself cosmically, intergalactically, and as an earthling. Um, and so sometimes when I am expressing queerness in my artwork, it is really through how I'm bringing, um, that otherworldly hybridity, that queer figure, the queer form, the out of ordinary form um, to, the, um, to the figure. And so this figure with these large pheasants is, um, you know, secretly inside of my heart, heart, heart is reflective of my partner and I. I'm gonna move through some of these works very quickly. This is a work called um, uh, the, the Intergalactic Black Boy in Flight. It's called Flyboy. 
And I'm really thinking a lot about what it is to be an earthling and how black folks have access to their full earthlingness, how black folks are able to access their deep love and their magic and their tenderness and their vulnerability um, in this world. So this is an incantation by sight. So by looking at this work and by following the images in the work, the secrets in the work, moving your eye over the piece is a ritual of release. It brings you deeper into your freedom, into the capacity of your wholeness to release um, fear and pain and grief and anxiety from your soul um, and to enter into the fullness of your identity as an earthling and as um, a being connected to the stars. So every work that I do, when I talk about making power figures, they are related to Congo and Kisi power figures, as you see here, the sort of bundles, the wraps, um, the wrapped cloth medicine packets, but there's often so the power of the moment, the power of the moment of being in a space and seeing something and feeling the actual power of feeling and being inside of the human technology of feeling yourself being alive and feeling yourself see and feeling yourself think. I, if I um, hold thinking as another sense also. So more uh, power figure work that is indicative to tribal Congo and Kisi power figures, throwing to that wrapped body to power packets and objects and symbols of power um, on the work and attached adorned to the body. Thinking about blackness and the medicine of adornment, the ritual of adornment, the ritual of black girls looking in the mirrors and looking in mirrors, putting makeup on, doing their eyebrows, putting eyelashes on and that ritual of being with self and loving with self and adorning to the body, your understanding of how you can move through your own creative choices to protect yourself, to heal yourself and to be in connection with your power as a human being. Um, this is these white based figures that are just the pure plaster of um, that lives underneath some of my other figures that gets covered with layers and layers of tar. Um, this is from oh, a body of work called The Phenomenology of Black Girlhood. And I'm thinking about um, the secret work that a lot of black girls do just to stay alive on this earth. So honoring the secret work, honoring the um, field of barbs that little black girls go to through just to be themselves and the way that um, your heart and your brain will make sense of things that adults don't even speak to. Um, this is a piece that I made for a young woman in honor of a young woman who was killed by a white supremacist outside of the BART station in the Bay Area. So turning then myself into recognizing um, moving intentionally with power in my practice as a performer. So as I did earlier, making a poem that really is a prayer, is an incantation, is a wish, is drawing on imagination, drawing on the energy of um, activating your creative instincts as close to the moment as they come. And this is a performance that I did at the Ford Foundation. And you see that I'm wearing an entire gown of bundled blue prayer beads. I use this color in my work a lot, this um, electric blue. And then you also see this electric blue and this bundled figure on Miracles and Gloria Bound, the MAGA installation. And this installation is a sculptural incarnation of Washington crossing the Delaware, but um, my central figure is uh, based on a single mother, Laquisha, Laquisha Washington crosses the day aware. And it is situated in a fictional city park where there are benches and trees of relief, trees of mercy, trees of grace, trees um, that offer you um, an entrance into being connected to um, your place of power and creativity in nature, but also thinking about monuments, thinking about central monuments and parks and who do we uphold and what do we see. Um, moving through this, I'm gonna, uh, this is just a clearer sort of side image of Miracles and Gloria Bound in the central boat. This is life size. The boat is 16 feet long. It has 13 figures in it. One is uh, a black, infant figure and um, it is on tour. That work is on tour. Um, images of me thinking about grief and how we're holding grief and how we're able to be 
on a land where we have lost so many people, but also there's so much stigma to expressing the grief and expressing pain and expressing trauma um, that is sometimes situated against this idea of self-care and this idea of being in the practice of loving yourself, which we act like is totally mutable, but it's not. And so to see images of us caring one another, um, also, you can tell me if anybody wants to tell me, because you know that what this image is, reflects. And uh, this is one of the last works, this work went into a show about uh, two weeks ago, and it's a map. It is an actual map of how I survived lockdown and COVID and what was happening for me um, and how I stayed healthy. Uh, this work is about six feet tall. Uh, thanks. I am really excited to have some conversation with Ann Collins Smith and with Cynthia. And I thank you, Justin, for your question. And I look forward to being, um, to hearing more questions and to being in conversation with my friend, the brilliant Ann Collins Smith. Hello, Vanessa. Thank you for that. It's almost, well, it is a worship service. So your generosity is not only radical, but it's gorgeous. So a question about you who gives so much. What are your sources and how do you writ grand source? So, um, for the first part of the question, can you speak more and open up how, what you mean by source? What are my sources? So what sustains you? What feeds you? Um, right now I'm in an Airbnb in Los Angeles and I came here for like half running away from the city that I live in most of the time because I cannot, I feel like I would like lose part of myself or break in a way that I can't mention if I have to watch another person die in the street or if I watch have to watch largely people hurt each other the ways that I have seen. Um, so one of the ways that I'm able to take care of myself is just through the privilege of having an active art practice where I can, I have mobility. And so I grew up in Los Angeles and I thought that when I got here, I was just gonna walk and be on the beach and my process through all of the compounded grief and trauma that is inside of me. But what ended up happening after two weeks is I went to Home Depot, I bought two power tools and I started building an entire body of work in this Airbnb. And so what I have to deeply acknowledge is one, whenever my ancestors come to me in dreams, when it is unbearable, because I find a lot of things that we are asked to bear truly compromising to our hearts in the world that we live in, like that we bear so many mass shootings and that we bear that in a way that sort of um, contributes to this numbness or paralyzation of part of our hearts. I really um, have to go to this place of dream and a place of heart and a place of like opening all of my wounds before my ancestors and like begging for help sometimes and begging for help to make it through the day, begging for help to be in connection with other human beings because I can be so frightened sometimes. And the only thing my ancestors ever say in these dreams when they come to me is create. It's the only thing that they say, but they'll say it with this enormous sound, like they could shake, like they could drop the entire sky against the earth and it, it's this big boom and they say create. And I think about how um, I was at Betty Sarr's granddaughter's art opening in, um, in LA and I was also at with Jill Mooney's at Transformative Arts downtown LA and she's good friends with Betty. And Maddie told me, she says, you know, she was like, I asked my grandmother, how do I make it through these struggles? How do I make it? And Betty Sarr told Maddie, just create, you have to keep creating. 
And she told the same thing to Jill yesterday. And I think about how that's all my ancestors say is create, create, create. And I think about what, it, what happens to the human brain in times of creativity. So that is a huge source for me is just opening to a space of imagination and vision and flow and allowing the frequency of creativity to shift my mental, emotional, and sometimes my physical state. Because so many things are happening to us when we are actively, intentionally creating and moving materials around. Um, so one of my other sources is love and faith. Like, and by faith, I mean not a particular re religious faith, but the sort of deep through the bone into the marrow of the earth faith that I am alive on purpose and that love is real and powerful. Um, and those are places that I return to in writing and those are places I return to because um, as somebody who works with a lot of different kinds of materials and attaching materials and making hundreds and hundreds of prayer beads, I recognize the meditative process of re repeated tasks as um, a physical entrance into a higher frequency where I'm able to be in relationship, in living relationship not theoretical relationship, but in living relationship with the love and the power that exists as a force of life. Um, and that is a major source for me. And that's not anything that anybody outside of me can give. But I also love talking to people. I love looking people in their eyes and having one-on-one -on -one conversations. I find that to be deeply nourishing. And uh, that question answer that I just gave you definitely weaves source in the heart with the large cosmic source also mm -hmm. which is the same source that's in my heart your heart print is indelible and thank you, and thank you. many of us well not as many but some of us are blessed to have some of your power figures, your works, your creations, given that they are sometimes made with organic materials, how long do you want them to last? I think about, I think about how living objects mm -hmm. of dimensional purpose live throughout time and in the world, I think about evidence of use and evidence of, um, evidence of purpose into loving knowingness. And what is the evidence of that in an object? Um, so when I started making work, I'm just walking around my neighborhood with like, two bags and picking up stuff and bringing stuff home. And in my, in my little basement studio, listening to Dr. King and Alice Walker and really imagining, really imagining creative art, creating these artworks that live in people's homes that become a part of how they're able to be okay in their life. Like I imagined making these small power figures that lived on people's side tables in their living room, that they had a special place in their kitchen, that kids would grow up knowing that this is a place that you can center reflection on, that you can touch before you leave your house to go to school, that when you lose an earring or if you lose a loved one that you can add something of them to this power figure and that it keeps gaining power but that it also keeps giving you power and that and that it is alive in a household and it's part of what helps you to be okay and that's what I imagined when I was making these figures I didn't ever know that they would be in museums I didn't ever know that they would go anywhere else I wanted them to help people to be whole. And so there's a way that I really love when a museum 
allows people to accumulate objects around the figures because it happens quite naturally in places. And I love that. And I, and I love that um, without being told that people will um, use the work that way. And so if the work is being used in that way, I am, it is more alive than it could be being protected in a conservation space, in a basement. And I would, I would love it if institutions that collect the work would not fear against the investment of the work that it is being useful to its community members in certain ways and that we're able to experience that. Um, but also because the work has some organic materials, sometimes the organic materials are totally hidden. They'll be in glass bottles and the bottle will be sealed is what it is. And a lot of times there's organic materials that are so bundled and so wrapped, they'll never touch the air again. But also I love the idea of the work being cared for and being mended. I love um, the way that we experience mend, mending in different cultures and that the care of the hands of the mender becomes a part of that work. Um, I really would love to show a large body of power figures for a year in one space and allow the community that is in that space to come for free and to have access to those figures, to spend time with them, to either put pillows or chairs in front of them where they can be with their own heart and reflection and that there can, whether there's guided meditation or visualization, um, but that they can also, um, you know, contribute to those figures by leaving objects and maybe at the end of the year, we would do a touch session where we would add bundles to them or we would add some of these objects to the figures um, and that they would actually change. They would be alive in a way that uh, I think sometimes can be fearful to institutions that have to protect investments and that are um, experience certain ways of being with work. Thank you. That's you're with us, a very long answer. Mm. Next time that um, Delia is on view or in experience at Spellman, I can't wait to invite the community to engage with the work. Thank you. Cindy, do you have any questions for Vanessa or for me? Oh, you're, yes. And I'm thinking of a place where we can have that installation, Vanessa. Mm -hmm. yeah wow thank you for you that the work that i'm doing in la like you should i'm really thinking about ceremony mm -hmm. and being in connection with the ordinary sacred in our communities and in places where um we are safe to be in access of our heart of our hearts and our intellectual prowess um, in ways that we might need individually. Um, but I'm, yeah, so I'm thinking about this also with this new body of work that I'm making. Where could it be? And how can I invite people to be full and whole and to use the work? I'm interested in that, in the work and in, in the power figures being really useful. Ironically, your work needs to be everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This has been amazing so far. I have a lot of questions, some that maybe have been half answered, but maybe we can dig into a little more. Um, so when, when, when Anne first shared um, Delia, you shared the full um, materials list with with us. And, mm -hmm. and Vanessa, I noticed that a lot of times mixed media will just be for for many institutions listed on on your works. Um, 
I loved so much the, as a conservator and as a human, both. I love the full list so much. And may I read it? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, old baby doll, sorry, old baby doll body, tar, red and white and black paint, bird salt and pepper shaker, cabbage slicer, iron on of Delia the slave, hot iron, rage, nails, wood plaster gauze, wood glue, fire in her eyes, small print of the Holy Mother on her back, meanness, clarity, how much pain to be quantified, the legacy, the legacy, the legacy. But those are the materials, right. <laughs> you know? And you know, I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that the pieces that are listed as just mixed media have similar materials in a sense that the they have. Yeah, they include it, visible and the invisible. And the invisible. Yeah, and sometimes people just don't want to print it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right, and yeah. Um, as a conservator, we love really detailed labels and I love this one the most. <laughs> Um, but, it, you know, my colleagues in our, our object conservation grapple with like the varying needs of these mixed media pieces. As a painting conservator, sometimes I have to deal with them too. Uh, I get to, I get to um, deal with that. But, you know, when I read that list, I think about sometimes in conservation, you might have uh, an iron nail and a piece of plaster and it starts rusting and cracks the plaster. And so those two, uh, those two materials aren't compatible. And, and so it makes me wonder how to sort of simultaneously conserve rage and clarity and plaster all at the same time. And, and if it's more okay, if some of those pieces start to fade away than others. Um, and, and then is it a different sculpture at that point? Is it a different piece? So one of the words that I keep saying that I think has different resonance for different people is the word living. For a thing to be alive, we know that it is changing and we honor its change. Um, suffering exists in the resistance to change and in the insistence to keep a thing one way forever, which if we think about painting conservation. I remember being at the Wadsworth and going into the conservation room and it being the closest I ever got to like a Van Gogh and a Dolly. And I saw what was happening and I was like, oh, how much of this painting is original now? How much of this, like they have to replace paint loss there. Somehow that painting got a hole right by that lady's nipple. And they actually have to repair the canvas and put more paint on it. And so things have changed. And the, what there is is this sort of like the magic of disguising the change and making the change be as seamless as possible. And so I think that um, it is a spiritual question to conserve love, rage, and clarity. That is in contention with the spirit. And it is um, always going to be present because in some ways, because the object existed, it, it exists. Um, and as far as like incompatible materials um, and how that changes, I think that within the technologies that conservators have, you fix things, you move on. And then when you leave that job, you pass it on to the next person. And when it comes time to fix something or repair something, they do it. And it does it happen every year? Does it happen every five years? Does it happen every 20 years? It happens. You clean things, things fall, things break, you can fix them. And, um, 
I uh, imagine what it would happen if it was in somebody's house. I would imagine how that would work with an iron nail that somebody found on the floor in their grandmother's house and wanted to add to a piece that they were living with. Um, we want the work to be alive. We want the work to be on view. And um, a life is, is a changing um, liquid thing sometimes. That's how I would answer that. Mm. You know, this world would have us not be emotional beings. Would you say that emotion is critical to your practice? Yeah, like emo my practice is not just a practice of making objects. Like I'm inside of my wholeness mm -hmm. every day, every way. Like I, I'm not clocking in and clocking in and out of my own lungs. Mm -hmm. This is always alive. And it is always the work of deeply becoming more of my whole self. And um, I would, hope in my imagination that if there are accountants out in the world that being an accountant is also a part of their wholeness and is not separate mm -hmm. from their humanity and from their wholeness and so <sighs> white supremacist delusion mm. relies on separating people from their emotional power um, separating and dividing um, and then creating ideas of prestige and reward around being separated from your heart, your soul, your spirit, your emotions. That has been really destructive, but it has also been super necessary for white supremacist delusion to hold people. And it's also been super, it is like, uh, it is how capitalism functions. Like you keep thinking you can buy your way out of whatever, that there's something that you can buy, that you have the freedom to purchase your way to something. And so what I recognize is that um, emotion is, you know, like one of the truest wildernesses that we have available to us. And it is a way without emotion, like how do you feel your own freedom? And, and so like emotion is important to my practice. Like emotion is important to me being a human being. It is actually so much more important than anybody ever told me. Like I feel like if I understood emotion more as a child, I would have suffered less confusion over um, in relationship to my identity, my body, my queerness, if I understood how emotion operated as a child. Um, but being in honest, intentional relationship with emotional technology is, uh, I don't know how to be alive without that. I don't know what it is to be human without that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know either. Feeling is wonderful. It's also deeply frightening sometimes. Like feeling pain, like pain is super scary to me, like heart pain, body pain. But also, I can feel through things in ways. Like I'm emotionally muscular. Thank you. Should Thank you. Yeah. Should we take some questions from the audience now? Yeah. And a wonderful afternoon. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. So Augusta says, thank you for this powerful and soulful expression. Your sculptures remind me of saints and of votive sculptures. As a child, I remember going to a basilica and seeing sculptures of pain yet gratitude and they that they shared with the community. I feel the same feeling with your work. Thank you. 
I feel that feeling in my work. I feel it in other people's work. It's a feeling that I look for in people's work. When I go to museums or spaces, I actually I like work to align myself with whatever part I can feel as sacred in a person's practice, whether it's on a wall label or not. But I seek the frequency of the sacred um, in the world and in other artworks. And it's a really powerful permission to give myself walking into museums being like, I want to see what I feel in this space with this specific work. Like what work is speaking feeling to me and what can I excavate in that um, wilderness of feeling in the work. I look for that sacred sensibility in all the artwork that I experience. And sometimes I find it profoundly and sometimes I hear emptiness around work. I hear like uh, the absence of a thing. So thank you for that. And I and trust that feeling. I trust that feeling for you. Um, people who have the capacity to move through the world in emotional, spiritual resonance with things are um, have access to a well of healing and power um, that is so much more profound than language. It is an incredibly powerful technology of soul to move with in your humanness. And so, um, so thank you for speaking to that. And I uh, am so grateful that you shared that. I have one more question for both of you. And there's, um, thank you so much for sharing about the power of being with the work and um, the profound difference there is in being in the same space as um, your work, as um, I think as Augusta said, as um, sculptures in a basilica. And as a curator and as an artist, how do you think about transmitting that power through documentation? I mean, for people who can't be with the piece, is there, is there a way, are there better ways to transmit it to people who can't get to the pieces? I think one of the things that we can do in the language of invitation to experience the work is to bring feeling language into the language of invitation to say um, and to invite people into a feeling process and to say perhaps as you, um, you're, I, you know, I, you're about to see a work, and to invite people to see the work with their eyes open, to see the work with their eyes closed, and to feel the work, and to be in connection with the work, and to like one of the things I ask is like, if this work of art had the power to do something, what might you think it has the power to do? And if it has the power to do that, where would you place it? Where it could be most impactful in its power? Um, but to invite people to experience the work in their invisible places uh, and to affirm that, that that's a way to be with work. The artist, phenomenal artist Toki Rome Taylor asks, um, what colors do you use? How does how do colors inform your work? I'll get specifically to the question. I use uh, repetitively white, red, white, blue, black, and gold in my work. Um, and those every color has its own dimensional resonance, um, politically, spiritually, socioeconomically, culturally, they all resound in a simultaneity of time, also past, present, and future. So when I'm using white, I am referencing the spiritual presence of my ancestors through the sort of white of a cowrie shell, the inside of a cowrie shell, the white of that I think about bones being bleached white. I think about all of the Africans who were enslaved on boats and, and jumped off of the sides of boats. And I think about August Wilson talking about the city of bones in the ocean. And in my mind, that city of bones and the way that Aunt Esther talks about it in the play, Jim of the Ocean, 
Um, she talks about how white the bones are. So when I'm using white in my work, I'm referencing that, but I also am bringing it to my first lessons about um, hearing about what the colors of the American flag symbolized and how white symbolized peace. And I got in trouble when I was a kid in school and I was like, whose peace is that? Um, is it, yeah, like, is that peace for everybody? Does everybody get to have that peace? Is it peace for the native people who this land was taken from? I totally got in trouble for asking like, whose peace, whose blood, whose glory? Um, and they were like, that's, that's like, eight hey, too many questions, little black girl just like take the lesson and eat it. Um, mm. So all of the colors have this resonance for me, past, present, and future, political, cultural, spiritual. I'm using red, white, blue, black, and gold consistently. When I veer out of those colors, it is super specific. Like I just made a power figure for um, in honor and to protect the spirit of Megan the Stallion. And it's a completely different color. Mm. Wow. We have so many great questions. Um, I'm trying to choose one. Uh, okay, concerning, this is from an anonymous attendee. Concerning miracles and glory abound, are the trees shown at the edge of the gallery part of the work? It's great as an environment. Uh, yeah, so the work is the entire installation and it is a city park. So there's benches in there and there's like people looking at there's creatures, these hybrid figures looking at the work. They're sort of awestruck and they're pointing at it. So there's the sky is projected onto the space and there's three suns in the sky. So it has this sense of being the science fiction environment, but the trees are part of the installation uh, and they change every time I do the installation. And they are, I think about uh, the tree of 40 fruits. I think about what it is to graft all these different fruits to make them grow from one tree. But I also think about the power that like nature is the cathedral of our world and our planet and how much healing and how much deep connection comes from that. And so the trees are like, this is a tree of love, a tree of mercy, a tree of grace, a tree to sit underneath to relieve your depression. I'm thinking about those spaces medicinally. I'm thinking about really expanding on how we language our relationship with nature. But when I talk about Miracles in Glory Park, I say it is a fictitious city park in a not city, in a not world. Mm. It is the benches in this not city, not park. They seem to offer you relief, but there's no relief to be found here. You know, so I definitely, in the way that you can read the text about miracles and glory, you can see that I'm also playing with the idea of being an artist and making spaces and making mythical spaces. And, and who gets to do that? And who gets to bring their myth into the, are like living historical canon the way that Lutz did with uh, Washington Crossing the Delaware, which they call the most famous painting in America. It wasn't painted in America. It wasn't painted by an American. It totally could not ever have happened. It's this moment of making that sort of set into stone this idea of power, these ideas about power. Um, so thanks for, uh, thanks for that question. And there's a question for you from, I think, a former colleague, Melissa Katz. Hello and greetings from a former colleague. My question, when you acquire a work of contemporary art for the museum, do you think in advance about the amount of money that will be required to preserve the work due to the choice of materials the artist decided to use? Or do you acquire the work purely for itself and assume that it's preservation and the cost of it? will be an issue for the conservators to figure out later with your job solely to think of the artistic value to Spelman. Hi, Melissa. Wow. I think both and. I think both and. I take a lot of leaps of faith, which I really don't talk about, but I take a lot of leaps of faith. If it's important now, it will be, you know, important then and the way will make itself. No to self, Miss Ann. But yes, thank you for that question, Melissa. And so good to hear from you. How are you? Yeah. 
Dr. Gentile Robinson has a question for, ben, um, I think for Vanessa, yes. I would like to know more about the Black botanicals and COVID-19. The oh, pandemic yeah. is worsening and are the botanicals going to continue? And how can those of us who are invested in healing health disparities in Latinx, Native American and African Americans get these botanicals to assist in the healing of our communities? So the botanicals, when um, the lockdown happened, I had been on the road all the time before. So I would be in a different city like every seven to 10 days. And it was, it's really difficult to ground in my own creative space when that happens. So I, when the lockdown came in, I was ready to not go anywhere. Um, and I thought that I would spend so much time in my studio and reorganizing it and building things, but that didn't happen. So I um, have a practice that I developed years ago of if I'm in a state of confusion or I don't know what to do or I can't think about what to make or I'm really depressed and I'm not like functioning well daily, I have a practice of just painting the Black Madonna as a practice of release, a practice of being, a practice of creating the environment that my body and soul will be able to thrive healthily and wholly in. So those of you who have an artistic creative practice, you probably know that thing that happens when you're in the act of making, how you are also making your own air and your own future spaces. So I do that actively in painting the Black Madonna. And I thought that when I came across those prints, those vintage botanical prints, that I was gonna make them into Black Madonnas. But what I really love is like faces that emerge in my work. So when I'm sculpting a face, there are no molds. It's just like my hands and the materials bringing the face forward. And I find it fascinating when people see my work and they're like, oh my God, that's my aunt. Like, how did you know that my great aunt, you know, loved this color and was here and I'm like, like this is not about knowing in that intellectual way. It is about bringing something forth. It is about like how Ella Fitzgerald said, she's like, I'm not just singing the song. She said, I'm bringing the song up. I'm bringing the song out. And so I'm really interested in the magical revelatory pro process of my practice. So when I sat down with the botanicals and these faces started to emerge in grayscale, I was there for that and present for that and present for really being in awareness of how thin the veil is in our spaces and how thin this idea is of this reality versus another reality and what we have access to. But that is also bringing back to what Betty Saar said, bringing back to what my ancestors speak to me in times of like my most desperate and all they say is create. So inside of that creative process, processing really a lot of fear that was happening in the world around the lockdown, the wild toilet paper war, wars that were happening, um, and then how violent things got in a country that is already like excessively violent. Uh, the practice of working on those botanicals and sitting still was crucial to my ability to focus in on what was important that was happening and let the static and the fray go, to sit down and to paint for hours and hours every day and to listen to NPR, but also be able to filter through the layers of heart and spirit and also um, ancestral presence was really important. And I think about how much I have hated myself in my lifetime, how hateful I've been to my mind, to my body and to my heart and the hateful messages that I've received about myself from other black people, from black women, from black girls um, to this day. And I think a lot about how difficult it is for black people, children or adults to have a just value for themselves, to actually love yourself and honor yourself and to be whole when you're surrounded and ensconced by a buffet of anti-Blackness and uh, like the secret self-loathing that is served to you through, um, that is like nourished through images in the media. So when I think about Black folks and COVID and the pandemic, and I think about vaccine hesitation, and I think about 
our wellness and our wholeness. For me, there is opportunity for us as loving, healing, creative, heart-centered human beings who know the power of living um, with dimensional resonance, of being a listener to your heart and a listener to your spirit. There is opportunity for us to speak to the love and value of our Black lives, our bodies, and our wholeness, and to our capacity to nourish our wholeness into every single ferocious nook and cranny of ourselves. Because as we are able to um, inflate inside of the wholeness of our humanness and our human beingness, we will bring into clearer frequency our capacity to see and to know ourselves. And when we see and know ourselves in this place of loving wholeness, the care that we give to ourselves in every single second and every single moment is amplified. So one of the ways that I move through the world in affirmation of the wholeness of Black people on this land is to make eye contact and to speak to, um, and a lot of times I will speak and I move instinctively because my instincts are so deeply connected to my ancestors and I speak to people, I make eye contact and I affirm something about their physical humanness and their invisible humanness. And this is like the public health advocate inside of me that recognizes like one of like the most silent epidemic is just hating yourself <laughs> and being depressed and being down and not actually having your own just scale to see yourself by. Um, and when you can't see yourself, you can't listen to yourself and listen to all the selves inside of you um, inspiring love for you and yourself. Um, and so I see this as an opportunity, as this time as an opportunity for us to be affirmed in our humanity and in the technology of our humanity and our wholeness and to connect that to living actions like how you care for yourself, your body when you wake up in the morning and when you move through this world. That's my answer, but I can answer more if you, if you, if that, uh, if I could be clearer about anything, I can do that. That was wonderful. Thank you. I am torn because that's such an amazing note to end on. At the same time, there is one question in the chat that from Lestarsha that I would feel, um, I, I want to ask. <laughs> so, um, Lestarsha McGarity, who is an amazing objects conservation colleague of ours, says, thank you for this presentation and sharing so generously. As an object conservator, I'm bringing care of an object's ashe as a practice, as a part of my practice. Can you speak briefly how you nourish, nourish I'm sorry, I'm starting to, to fade. Can you speak briefly how you nourished the ashe uh, of your works and installations? Thank you, Liz, uh, for the question. So I move in um, there's a part of the practice that is intellectual. Uh, mechanical, that's like engineering, structural engineering. Um, but there's also a part of my practice that is me being alive with the material and the work and listening. And that is a place that has carried me for years, like trusting, listening to the objects and uh, working intentionally, but also in mystery and in revelation without obstacles. So one of the ways that I nourish the spirit 
um, and the root system of the work in connection to all the makers in the line of my family and connected to my physical human body is to be um, an open door for revelation and to speak kindly to it inside of the practice because doing new things when if you've been successful one way doing new things can be scary um, but also as somebody as this place that I'm in now and the body of work that I'm making and really interested in consciousness in the awakened aliveness of of what it is to have the force of life inside of the body. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so I'm working with consciousness more intentionally in this new body of work. So it is that process of not being an obstructionist to revelation and mystery in my process, but it is also with sitting with the work and looking at the work and, and moving consciousness into the work and through the work on purpose um, and with faith and and it's a learning process like nobody is teaching me these things like I am I don't have like a guide you know there's no you know I can't just call Betty Sar. <laughs> I can't just like you know I it is me trusting the line of light that is sparking inside of me and following that line and investing in it um, courageously, which is hard. But one of the things that is really important is to recognize that more than one thing is happening at the same time all the time. And letting that truth be, like not trying to control things too much in that way, more than one thing is always happening at the same time. This has been such an incredible conversation. I um, I wish we could keep on going, but we, I guess at some point have to end. And um, an amazing touching comment just came in in the questions from Robert Steele. I would like to make a statement. I was introduced to art at Morehouse College. I was the former director of the David Driscoll Center who collected her work early in her career. Currently, I'm on the governing board of the Yale Art Gallery. This event shows many aspects of my life's work. Wonderful program, Bob Steele. Hi, Bob Steele. I remember you. You remember me? We met. All right. It's good to see you again. I think he does. And thank you so much. Um, thank you. There are so many thank yous in the, in the questions and in the chat. I'm, I hope we can save them just so that we can look back at them. Um, are there any sort of final thoughts either of you would like to express? We received one of our benedictions is trusting the line of light. And I'm honest us all to trust that line of light. Yes. Trust the line of light inside of yourself, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, more than one thing is happening at the same time. So while we work as artists, while we work as conservators, while we are students, while we are curators, while we um, just help the Zoom meeting run, more is happening than that. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity in this time of change and shift to, as Cindy began the talk saying, talking about care and how we care for each other in side of all of our other identities. The future that we make, we will build through the care that we insist upon having in all of the spaces where we're human, on the Zoom, on at the bank, 
at the grocery store, how we insist on caring for one another in every place where we exist as human beings will be one of the most powerful future shaping tools that we have, which requires us to follow the line of light that really sources itself through our hearts. So trust your heart in all of the ways that you are alive. And to see more of Vanessa's work, you can follow her Instagram, Vanessa L. German. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you both so much for gracing us with your presence today. And thank everyone who came to listen. And thank you so much to our HBCU SMITA students from this week as well for allowing this to happen. Thank you. And everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you for your questions and thank you for your comments. See you next time. <laughs>